action plan for third ward in the hopes of accomplishing three things. One is to tell you all the exciting things that the city and our partners are doing or has uh, worked on. Two is to find out what you all are working on that I may not have captured. Um, not saying that, you know, it hasn't taken place. It's just I don't have a record of it in order to include it in this in uh, tonight's report. And three is to find ways that we can uh, collaborate together so we can progress on the projects that you know, may not have moved forward on the action plan um, because ultimately the complete community's action plan requires coordination from the city, the community, and the partners. But before I get into the details, I'm going to give a high level overview of what complete communities is. I know that um, a lot of you have been involved since day one, and it's really good to see a couple familiar faces. And I also want to acknowledge that there was um, a list of questions that were provided to us in advance of the meeting that we will address at the end of the presentation by Director Shannon Bugs. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started, but I'm also going to let you know that I'm going to go through some portions of the PowerPoint quickly because there's a lot um, there's a lot of projects, there's a lot of updates, and I really want to be sure that we have plenty of time to address any additional questions that you may have, but you will get a copy of this presentation. So here's a quote from Mayor Turner, uh, which is basically explaining his signature initiative that was launched in 2017, uh, really for the city of Houston to work with the community in order to create a collaborative and transformative citywide effort to revitalize under resource and underserved neighborhoods. In 2017 is when this initiative launched and there were five communities at the time, Acres Home, Golden, near Northside, Second Ward and Third Ward. And then in 2019, Mayor Turner launched the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities, appointed its first director, Shannon Bugs, and announced the an, um, and announced the addition of five additional neighborhoods, which are shown on the screen: um, A Leaf Westwood, Fort Bend Houston, Cashmere Gardens, Magnolia Park, Manchester, and Sunnyside. Because the mission of this initiative is really to address the historical inequities in economically distressed communities so that all Houston residents and businesses um, can have access to quality services and amenities close to where they live and work. Um, and ultimately, this represents about one in six of uh, Houstonians in area. Um, I also wanted to provide a high level overview on what is the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities, um, because uh, basically, you know, we work to facilitate the implementation of the action plans. We do this collaboratively with residents and community stakeholders, and we also work with all city of Houston departments and divisions with city leadership from the mayor's office of complete communities, the planning and development department and the department of neighborhood. Here you will see um, an org chart that shows some of the members of that team. Um, the kind of dark blue uh, is representing the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities under the leadership of Director Bugs. Um, then there's myself. I work with um, the community stakeholders um, in terms of different you know, organizations and such. And then of course, the Planning and Development Department really takes the lead on the community engagement side. Um, here you'll see all the members in terms of the different uh, lead planners. And then of course, um, Sasha, um, who um, graciously hosted us tonight, represents the third ward community in addition to Acres Home. Um, we also have the Department of Neighborhoods, who has the Mayor's Assistance Office, and the representative for third ward is Carl Davis. Ultimately, the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities, in addition to overseeing the action plans, is responsible for facilitating the work of cross-departmental efforts and partnering with the right people and organizations to work together to develop long-term community solutions. The planning department and department of neighborhoods, like I previously stated, works with the residents to organize and lead community level improvements and programming. But really we all work together in order to build relationships, really just to move the agenda forward, which is the action plan that the community laid out for us and for each other. Here's just kind of a quick diagram that shows how that work aligns with one another. Um, collaboratively, you know, we really aligned the action plan projects with the implementation efforts of the city, the community, and our external partners. We are 
truly committed to giving our time um, and our efforts to moving um, and improving the third ward community. Um, and this, and we, but we don't necessarily have a dedicated budget to move forward on these projects. But the city of Houston has expended and focused and budgeted um, so far over $53 million into third ward since the initiative was launched in April 2017 using various kinds of funding sources, including over $29 million from the TERS and over $22 million of CDBG funds, which stands for Community Development Block Grant Funds. And if you're unfamiliar with that, that's basically a federal program that is administered um, by the federal agency called HUD, which is the Housing and Urban Development uh, Department. Um, that, uh, those funds get funneled down to the Housing and Community Development Department, who has various programs and such of how um, they fund programs and projects in the community. Here you'll see a more detailed report of what those funds represented, the various projects. So, um, for example, um, you'll see, you know, the homeowner assistance program and um, specific housing development projects, such as um, the Change Happens development, which was funded by uh, 12 .2, about $12.2 million of disaster recovery account funds and then um, there's also the TERS that made significant infrastructure improvements um, in the community as well. Because ultimately the action plans for third ward were created by the community and for the community after almost a year of engagement and collaboration with thousands of stakeholders. Um, the action plan outlines the shared vision to guide the community revitalization in the community. And now I'm going to briefly go over some of the action plan updates from that plan. Um, but once again, there's a lot of projects that were included in the action plan and I have a written summary. Um, but for tonight's presentation, I'm just going to give a high level overview of some of the accomplishments and some of the items I was able to analyze when creating this presentation. Because once again, we have three goals tonight, which is um, to tell you what we're doing, to find out what you all are working on, and then, and then three, to find ways that we can collaborate together. Um, I'll also. Oh, I'm sorry. I also want to acknowledge that some of the projects were impacted by COVID-19 um, and we have a little symbol that represents those projects that were impacted. Um, since the initiative was launched prior to COVID-19, I do have some updates from that, but then some of the progress was impacted, which is shown in the little uh, red cross symbol. My apologies, I am missing a slide accidentally. I'm not sure what's going on, but ultimately there, I have a progress of about 70% of the action plan. Um, I uh, will definitely make sure that that is addressed before we send this out publicly, um, but uh, I do have a summary slide that shows each focus area from the action plan and the ultimately uh, cumulative result. So first, I'm going to kick it off with civic engagement. The goals of the civic engagement focus area, according to the action plan, were to nurture community leaders, expand neighborhood advocacy, and to increase civic engagement. And according to what I was able to track, um, I have about 26% that's been completed. And I think it's because some of these projects really require the community to take the lead on some of these projects. And according to what I was able to gather, um, I have an update in terms of um, a youth leadership program that was under the leadership in the mayor's office of education. Um, but for example, the, the project that is here that says to organize an annual state of third ward summit is really under the leadership of the community. Um, and as far as I'm aware, I don't think that has taken place, but it's not too late to initiate it. Um, but I just wanted to point that out in terms of some of the updates that I was able to gather under this section. Um, definitely, this is something um, that we can work on together. Um, Sasha is more than willing to um, help to initiate some of these things with you, um, but please keep us um, updated if this is something that has already taken place. 
in economy and jobs. Um, the goals for economy and jobs were to expand workforce opportunities, to attract new economic development, and to grow the local economy. And I'm happy to announce that our office now has a FUSE fellow working with the city to help build equitable workforce opportunities for all the complete communities. Um, and if Ken is on the line, um, I would like for him to introduce himself to the community so he can state a little bit about what he's um, been working on. Hi everyone, again, my name is Ken Williams. I'm the FUSE Executive Fellow working in the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities. I am a native Houstonian, born and raised on the south side of Houston in Hiram Clark, graduate of Madison High School. When I went on to attend and graduate from UT Austin, got a little bit tired of being in Texas, so I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, where I got to work on some DI initiatives at higher education institutions, Georgia Tech and Georgia State University. Um, I'm been away from Houston for about 12 years now, so I'm I'm excited to come back home and do some amazing work and get people back into some high paying, great quality jobs. Um, so, so far what I've been working on is creating clear strategic partnerships across the green infrastructure industry right now. And how can we, how can we create clear pathways for individuals and in our com complete, complete communities to these high paying jobs? So great to be here, glad to be on the call. Send it back to you, Krista. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, and, and just wanted to also just highlight, I know that you all are working on workforce opportunities as well. And if that's something that you would like to discuss with either myself, Sasha, or Ken, please feel free to reach out um, so we can uh, discuss what does that look like. But according to what I was able to track from um, the various partners and the departments I engaged with, I was able to track about 80 eight percent of this section almost complete. Um, I saw that Melanin Market kicked off in Third Ward at 2525 Emancipation Avenue when it comes to the pop-up spaces and projects. Um, I saw um, in terms of mixed-use development, the Walkable Places Initiative kicked off in order to help um, ignite economic development opportunities along Emancipation Avenue. Also, um, under the leadership of EEDC, um, they identified small businesses in the community in order to help initiate shopping um, locally at Third Ward. Um, I also uh, looked into um, some of the work in terms of um, the Main Street program that they have. And then uh, recently, the Office of Business Opportunity announced a, a webinar series that they're doing in terms of job training programs. So um, really, economy and jobs seems to be thriving according to what I've been able to track. And I'm pretty sure that there is so much more work to be done, um, of course, in collaboration with the entire team internally, externally, and more importantly, collaboratively. In the education section, the goals for education were to nurture parents and their lifelong learning, expand opportunities for out of school enrichment, expand access to quality early childhood education, and increase overall educational success. Um, unfortunately, you know, some of these projects were also impacted by COVID, but I think one of the most exciting um, updates when it comes to the education section is um, recently, um, as of last month, if you um, didn't see the press release that went out, um, HESS, which is an oil and gas corporation, committed over $9 million to supporting educational projects in three of the complete communities, one of them being Third Ward. Um, and this is a three-year commitment. Basically, it's a model in order to support um, local organizations and nonprofits um, to impact the feeder pattern of third ward schools from pre-K all the way to college. Um, so here I um, show a couple updates in terms of creating a directory of out of school programs that took place um, under an initiative called Out to Learn, which is under the leadership of the education office in the United States. Um, but here you'll see some of the examples um, so for example, um, corporation funded uh, uh, in middle school to have um, C STEM programming um, at 
from a particular location. Um, every institute, high school, universities, so work for the work they're doing, and um, robotics, and other things learning. Um, you get school, um, also has um, support for um, a return program, an after school education uh, program, and they also um, receive support for some computers. Um, so basically they help with programming. They also help fund some positions at these schools, different wraparound specialists and all success advisors. Um, also, I want to point out that has also supported an organization called Alliance um, Financial Industries, which financial education for you, um, in middle schools and high schools. Because as we all know, financial empowerment is needed in order to really sustain, um, even though you life, and the sooner you learn schools, um, the, the more successful you'll be later in life. So here's just more examples of the different projects and programs that were supported at Gates High School. Um, I want to point out the counseling and reference position and um, OSM the uh, child education um, support with which is supporting 10 child care centers in the community. The health section. The goals of the health focus area were to get access to healthy food and health services and promote opportunities for activity. Now, uh, with COVID-19, the city of Houston's health department immediately had to shift and respond um, to COVID uh, response and, and education, but there are still a number of projects that still um, move forward. Um, some were just impacted by COVID. Um, I was 66% of the projects moving forward. Um, one of them in terms of expanding counseling and other supportive services families. The health department does actually um, provide services. They definitely do provide for uh, referrals and they are um, a resource there. There's also the Dawn Center the, at uh, the multi-service center which provides different programs and search and such in partnership with uh, CERT and the Children's Museum. Um, we also have some preventive um, health care and healthy access. Also, um, late early last year, um, the rice management company partnered with Rice in order to distribute 100,000 pounds of produce to 375 families in the Black Country. And then there were some gardening programs um, that were in place at the multi service center that were impacted by COVID. Um, I don't have this update if can come back online, but definitely as Houston begins to open back up, I'm confident that we can get back on track. Hey, Krista, this is Valerie. I don't mean to and interrupt. For, you're, you're breaking up very oh, bad. Heck. Oh, no. Okay, so I'm going to shift my audio. Thank you. Hold on. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yeah, I think that might, I think that's gonna work out. Sorry, I, I, again, I didn't mean to interrupt, but. <laughs> I appreciate you for interrupting because absolutely wanna be sure that people can hear the presentation. So thank you so much for pointing that out. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to um, pause here and ask for an update um, in the housing section from uh, the Housing and Community Development Department. Um, I'm going to defer to Ray Miller about an exciting initiative that is also taking place right now for Third Ward. Oh, thank you, Krista. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, to let everyone know, so the, how, the City of Houston is uh, is currently participating with the Houston Housing Authority in what is called a Choice Neighborhood uh, Planning Grant Initiative. Uh, a very long word and a very long description, but it, it is a program that is administered by uh, by HUD. 
And last summer, both the city and the housing authority applied for a $500,000 planning grant uh, for a planning study for the CUNY homes um, uh, uh, property and the neighborhood itself. And so let me give you a quick, a quick initial discussion of what this is. And, and we were awarded this planning grant uh, in January of this year. And, and, a, and a thrill and, and an opportunity that we, uh, we, would, we would love to leverage. And so since that time in January, both the city and the housing authority has been uh, discussing about uh, putting together a coalition and what we call task force to identify three main uh, needs. So during this uh, planning study, we would be identifying the needs, what would be needed for the housing needs for the CUNY homes in the third ward. The, the planning study will also identify a component to reflect for the neighborhood needs and what are the neighborhood assets that, that we can leverage on, um, and, but what could also be improved. And then people is the final item that we're gonna make sure that uh, the individuals that live within the neighborhood and, and within CUNY homes uh, can be most served. And so over the next three to six months, there's gonna be a, a planning study in it with the commission and uh, individuals uh, assigned to each task force to review and, uh, and provide an analysis of what these needs could be. And when that happens and when, when the, we're able to culminate with, with some results, that launches some additional steps that you know, we would do, then do to take, uh, to take this into what we would call potential implementation. But, but just as an overall uh, highlight, but just letting everyone know now, there, you know, the activities that's being done is to analyze and study what would, it, what would be needed. And then this plan would, once it's finalized, would go back to HUD. And we would then ask for uh, potentially another grant from HUD to actually do the implementation to do the revitalization uh, the capital improvements for the housing in the neighborhood that that we are planning to do right now. So I just wanted to announce that this is a fantastic opportunity that you know, the city and the housing authority is, is working on together. Um, the complete communities and the planning department is deeply embedded within uh, within this activity, as well with all the community partners that we are working with. Uh, the third ward has a, a rich history and a rich tradition of, of working and having and targeting these opportunities. And that's what we're going to do. And that's what we're going to do for the next year before we come up with the final plan. And this plan will be vetted. It will be uh, provided and, and given a, a, a opportunity for public intake before any real action is made. But it is also the opportunity where we know within a situation with all the assets that we have today and what the third ward has to offer, um, that is, it, but now's the opportunity to take to take the next steps on this. Um, so more to come. Uh, we have just now started this process. The planning is now happening. The meetings are now happening. Um, and as we do, we're gonna be working with the residents of CUNY homes to find out what their needs are, what the opportunities and where are the points within the neighborhood that we can leverage. Um, and so, uh, as we go through and as we provide these updates uh, through the complete communities group and the planning group, um, I'm happy to come back and provide these updates and as we move forward. But uh, we are the first uh, first kept couple of steps in the long journey in this process. Thank you so much, Ray. I really appreciate that explanation and the update. Um, really, I think this is going to be truly impactful um, and inclusive for the third ward community and really excited to work on that with the greater team both internally and externally but i'll also give you some updates from the action plan that i was able to track um, uh, so the housing and community development department as stated earlier um, helps to administer the cdbg funds um, and i've been able to track about five projects that's been supported in third ward um, since the initiative started which cumulatively uh, totals about 277 units of affordable housing created um, costing about 70 million dollars um, so um, here's just a high level snapshot of some of those projects. I'm not going to um, go into the details of them, but some of them include um, the senior living facility um, that was uh, opened this year, um, the Citadel. Um, there's also um, the Change Happens project that I stated earlier. Um, 
There was also the Northern Third Ward uh, planning project identified over 300 homeowners um, with, you know, the survey that they did in terms of homestead um, exemptions um, that they helped to facilitate and workshops. Um, there's really a lot of housing projects and, and status updates that we were able to track and move forward. I know that this was a really important focus area for the community um, based on um, some displacement concerns and um, really think that this initiative that Ray explained will really help move forward on some of the other items, especially in terms of policy that can help um, move forward on the ones that have not progressed as of yet. Um, so here's just another snapshot of some of the demolitions that took place in terms of abandoned structures, um, et cetera. Mobility and infrastructure. In the mobility and infrastructure section, uh, the goals were to improve mobility, improve streets, and expand bike lanes and amenities. And really due to the leadership of the TUR 7, um, a lot of that has moved forward. They've made um, significant improvements on several streets um, and it, it improved not just the actual drivable area, but the sidewalks, amenities, um, you know, benches, lighting, um, et cetera. But also the city of Houston worked with Metro and Microsoft in order to provide free Wi-Fi on transit um, in Houston, one of them being the Purple Line in um, Third Ward. Um, here you'll just see some of those streets that were improved, um, the amount budgeted and funded with them. Um, also, there was a request for a parking district, which could be um, potentially implemented with the Walkable Places Initiative that was explained earlier. Um, B-Cycle um, was a project that was requested and we um, implemented um, different locations across third board, one being at Change Happens, Project Row House, University of Houston and Texas Southern, Emancipation Park. Um, also the TERS took the lead on helping with some bike lane improvements um, and drainage improvements. And neighborhood character, um, you know, truly culture um, and, and the character of the community is part of what makes it feel like home. Um, so uh, there was um, some improvements in terms of um, art opportunities and creating different events to celebrate the culture of the community. Um, and due to COVID, some of those events weren't able to really uh, move forward, but we do have some progress on that under the leadership of um, one of the city of Houston divisions in the mayor's office called MOCA, which stands for the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. They have um, facilitated major art projects to support the culture, um, such as the city's first resident artist program. Um, and uh, here you'll see a little bit of a snapshot of that with the National End Endowment of the Arts. They also helped to support a, a storyteller program um, by supporting Mark Newsom and creating different video series um, featuring different residents and artists. Definitely we know, you know, Project Row House has um, really been taking the lead on telling um, the story in the community for many years. Um, also wanted to acknowledge um, the, the progress that's under, uh, well, that took place and it's also additional um, improvements that are going to happen um, in the future due to um, the Emancipation Historic Trail. This was something that was strongly advocated for by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee in order to really document the historic trail from Galveston to Freemanstown and then of course Emancipation um, Park. Um, i.e. Third Ward, um, and under the leadership of the Freemanstown Conservancy, they're really helping to build programming on how all those dots connect and how, you know, we really are telling the story of, um, you know, African Americans um, and, uh, thriving in Houston. Um, you know, recently, uh, Juneteenth, um, which has always been a holiday, in my opinion, is now a federal holiday, right? So really helping to tell the story of how Houston has really impacted um, this, nat this nation, which of course was really built off the backbone of Third Ward. 
um, here. Um, there's also some progress being made in terms of illegal dumping. That's definitely um, personally a pet peeve of mine um, when it comes to, you know, just the different trash in the community. And I know um, Third Ward has really taken the lead on um, taking ownership of trying to put trying to stop that and saying third water's home and, and, and the different signs and such that are put up across the neighborhood. Um, but also at the city level, we're aligning with each other so we can see what we can do um, in terms of trying to get more trucks and, and, and really trying to be more proactive to encourage people to stop illegal dumping in the community as well. This is just showing um, more um, amenities and such that's taken place. Um, for example, um, the mini murals that are um, around the community, which was really helped uh, to be spearheaded by MOCA again. Um, one being installed at Emancipation in Elgin, one at Emancipation in McGowan, the other at Emancipation in Blodgett and the last one at Emancipation in, in Wheeler that was funded by um, the Houston Arts Alliance. Um, and that was in partnership with Mocha Up Art Studios. And that was about $75,000 that was invested into uh, making that come to life. And they also um, supported um, local um, mural artists from Third Ward in order to um, come up with the designs and what should be on those boxes. Um, this is just showing more programming and such that's been supported. Um, for both the youth and um, public art as well at, at various locations, such as um, Texas Southern and um, Dance Houston, um, Project Row House again, and parks and community amenities. Um, I am going to press pause here and ask if anyone is here from the Houston Parks and Rep Recreation Department in order to speak about um, a, a recent update that's coming for that. Uh, yes, Krista, my name is Ken Roberts and I'm a project manager of Parks and Recreation. Mike asked me to sit in for him on the meeting tonight and I can give you an update if you're ready. Thank you so much, we're ready. Okay, one of the big things we're excited about this week is uh, the completion of Zuri Malone Park. And this has been something we've been working on for about three months. And we're looking to have a, a big opening party this weekend. It's called Love Our Parks Fest. And it will be this Saturday at uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And we're going to have activities like basketball, group fitness, face painting, line dancing, arts and crafts. And it's all going to be free. We're hoping everyone will come out and join us. Uh, in addition to Malone Park, we're about one week away possibly from completing our park. Uh, we had a little bad weather, which slowed down our installation of the new playground equipment, but we're hoping that'll happen next week. Uh, a few other things. We have a project going on with Peggy Park, and that is a, a project backboard. Uh, we've uh, talked to a local artist who designed a mural, a mural based on DJ Screw. She was inspired by him. I guess you guys may know about him. Rob Earl Davis is his name. And uh, so that's something that's exciting as well. And then Mike is involved in a McGregor Park meeting for the master plan this evening. So we're moving forward with that as well. And that's pretty much where we are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken. I really appreciate that. Um, and once again, if you're available to come out this Saturday, um, can you please repeat the time again, Ken? Sure. It's 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Awesome. Definitely come out and support. It sounds like a really fun event, um, especially now that you know, we're kind of transitioning back into being able to safely gather. Um, definitely, it sounds like a great opportunity to come together and see all these great improvements. But um, I'm going to go back into the progress report. Thank you so much again, Mr. Roberts. Um, according to the action plan, I have about 66% of projects that I was able to track a uh, movement on. Um, one of uh, them being uh, the University Village Pocket Park. I know that that um, definitely was a part, a project that took a lot of coordination um, from various internal and external parties, um, Public Works Office, um, the Council Members Office, our office, the Planning Department, and then of course the community. Um, so really excited to see that project finally come into life um, and, and really kick off. And I, and I hope that everyone's being able to enjoy the pocket park that was able to be brought. Um, also, uh, healthy outdoor communities, um, and if you're not familiar with them, they've really um, 
been working closely with the community, um, I would say for about almost two years now. Um, please excuse me if that's incorrect. Um, but they're working with the third ward, the third ward and Acres Home community on moving forward on several projects um, in collaboration with the Parks Board. Um, they recently had a, a virtual activity, but then um, they're also looking um, to how we can work to improve Columbia Tap Track tap trail excuse me <laughs> um, but here's also a list of some of the um, improvements that ken was able to explain in terms of what has taken place at um malone park um, they helped to restrain the pergola bring in bar barbecue pits and uh, playground equipment um, at our park um, they renovated the pavilion and um, there's going to be some new grass and repairing some of the con uh concrete um, oh, excuse me. I want to also acknowledge the Healthy Art Outdoor Communities um, beginning uh, next month is, is looking to uh, choose projects and programming to support this fall. And if that's something that you're interested in and getting more involved in, um, I'm not sure if uh, Jennifer Boley was able to join us tonight, um, but definitely we can connect you to the lead of that organization so you can find out how you can be a part of the working group. And lastly, uh, safety is the last focus area um, that was in the action plan. Um, the goals were to um, have a stronger partnership with law enforcement and provide a safe environment for pets and creating a safe place for residents. Um, I do see that uh, Sergeant Corey uh, Cloud is here. Um, if you would like to speak, you are more than welcome to introduce yourself to the community. If not, I can uh, proceed with the presentation, but I did want to acknowledge and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you all. Greetings. Glad to be here. Sergeant Cloud, I represent the Houston Police Department, Patrol Region 2 Command, Chief Patricia Cantu's office. And my main role there is just to continue building relational policing in the community, coming up with new projects and continuing the great ones that we have in our department. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, so I've been able to track, oh, I'm sorry. Were you, can, are you can, uh, concluding? Okay. Um, so I've been able to track about 30% of projects moving forward. And I think it's also um, another example of projects um, that need community uh, leadership on some of the implementation efforts. So for example, for street lighting, um, this is definitely something that um, we can look into uh, with the public works office, um, but it requires um, an application from the community. Um, that's not something that we, we can really take the lead on, but I did provide the link here, and that is something that could be sent as a follow-up item if someone has a specific uh, street light that they would like to see improved. Um, but there also uh, was a request to use SEPTED pr principles, which stands for crime prevention through environmental design in order to enhance safety. Um, and the health department works with um, the police department on some of those efforts. Um, so this is just a quick summary of, of what that looks like. But um, here's another example of, for example, a block captain program. Um, now, I think that that's something that we can support, um, especially with the Department of Neighborhoods who works closely with residents in order to um, move forward on whatever projects the community wanted to see. Um, but that really um, requires community leadership um, there's also, you know, the, the program in here about the PIP meetings, the positive interactive program, um, and I believe they transitioned online, um, but that's also a, a more community led project. Um, but here you'll see one about working with HPD to identify other programs about community relationships. And as you can see, Sergeant Cloud is right here and he works um, directly with different residents in order to just do that. Um, so for example, um, they have what they call the TAP Center, which is the teen and police center in order to build those better relationships. Um, there's also um, the Greater Houston uh, Police Activities League, uh, which works with youth, with youth, excuse me, and volunteers to participate in different educational and mentoring um, activities as well. 
And um, now I'm going to press pause on my presentation to acknowledge some of the questions um, that were submitted from the community. Um, and I would like to also introduce uh, my director, Shannon Bugs, um, so she can help address some of these questions um, if, if I think she's able to do so. Hi, everyone. I am um, sorry for uh, not being on screen just yet, but I will be in just a second. No problem. To pull up the. Um, OK, hold on. Okay, I'm here now. I'm going to share my screen to get to uh, the questions. Krista, I don't. I'm trying to get to. It's not letting me pull it up. Oh, here it is. Okay. So we've already done this. Um, we are now at the questions part. Okay. So the first question that we got. Oh, oh, what happened? Did I do that? Okay. Here we go. OK, thank you so much for submitting the questions to us. I don't know if you can see me. OK, um, but the first one was about how much. Is Wait, should I... I'm sorry, Krista, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I can hear you now. I can hear you at first. OK, I'm working with my talk. Hopefully it'll uh, be loud enough. OK. Uh, we got uh, several questions back from the community, and so we've answered them with these slides. The first one was, how much money is currently in the fund? From which sources? How much has been spent? How much remains? And the plans and processes for prioritizing and spending the remaining amount, as well as the standards and protocols for resident engagement in the raising, prioritizing, and spending of the future funds. Um, in an earlier slide uh, in the presentation, we detailed the sources and amounts of the public funding that's committed to third ward. Uh, that came in from 2017 to the current fiscal year. That funding report was very comprehensive and it totaled um, and uh, some of the money is allotted in budgets that will be spent in fiscal years and some are going up to fiscal year 2023. So I think uh, you saw that there was funds coming from the TERS, uh, funds coming from the Capital Improvements Plan. We also had CDBG funding and I think that was already discussed earlier. So it's a comprehensive approach to keeping again discretionary funding that the city has uh, in order to be able to direct funds to the Complete Communities um, Initiative. And then the Complete Communities Improvement Fund um, is administered by the Greater Houston Community Foundation. And um, that's a 501c3 nonprofit that provides an appropriate vehicle for the community investments that are donated. Uh, the donations to the CCIF increase the capacity of our local nonprofits to provide project management expertise that's integral to implementing our viable and sustainable solutions for underserved communities in Houston, as identified in the action plans. Uh, the majority of the funds that are donated to CCIF are designated gifts that specify projects and programs that align with the donor's social investment strategy. And the MOCC monitors the action plan progress to track projects and programs that need support in order to recommend them to potential donors. Mayor Turner announced uh, about two weeks ago that uh, we have achieved the goal that he originally set for the Complete Communities Improvement Fund of uh, raising $25 million on behalf of our underserved and under-resourced neighborhoods um, that have been designated as complete communities. Um, we had some major contributions. Um, and some of those 
are funds that are still coming in. So this is based on uh, funds received and funds pledged. And um, we are very happy to say that uh, after two years and nine months, um, we were able to achieve the goal that Mayor Turner had set for us. Um, but again, a lot of those funds are designated for particular programs and projects. And the way we have involved the community in that work is that we use as the starting point for all conversations the Complete Communities Action Plans and the um, work that the residents did on behalf of identifying where their top priorities are. And as Krista has gone through uh, this evening, you've been able to see uh, where the high priorities were and our progress on that. And so that's our starting point for all conversations with potential donors. But a lot of companies, as you know, have their own social investment strategies. And so we make sure that we find alignment that meets their uh, uh, goals on how they want to invest back in community and align it with what the residents have said they wanted done in their communities. The next question we received uh, was, what standards and protocols for engaging residents and work groups are used when new initiatives are launched? The planning and development department manages ongoing civic engagement in our complete communities. Lead planners are assigned to each of the complete communities and they regularly participate in work group meetings, super neighborhood meetings, and other community led collaboration efforts. The PD department actively works with any organization that reaches out to the department for assistance and they are available to help engage the community and conduct surveys, produce data and maps, for instance. Um, some of the examples of the work that they've been doing are the 5050 Parks Partners Program, which is meant to attract corporate donors who can invest in our uh, neighborhood parks. Um, that are most in need of uh, attention and capital improvements. Uh, we do have a, um, a park uh, uh, funding uh, strategy that was developed in the 80s uh, that uh, has allowed for several inequities to um, be present in how the city is able to manage the capital funds that are raised through development fees in order to address uh, the capital needs of the parks. And so 5050 is an effort to get corporations to help us with that inequity until we can get some changes in the policies. We also have um, uh, planners working with neighborhoods on tree plantings. And then of course, our mayor's office of cultural affairs leads the whole mini mural project that um, is a way of helping to beautify um, many neighborhoods across the city, but especially the complete communities. We also have a key department leaders um, for the planning department um, as well as the Department of Neighborhood and Neighborhoods and um, Mayor's Office of Complete Communities meet monthly to discuss projects and coordinate activities or plan activities. And the next question we had was, why is there not any support for protections and preservation in this or other complete communities? There seems to be inequitable hurdles to developing more density um, so they gave some examples, but um, for an area to qualify for neighborhood character protections, such as special minimum lot size and small, special minimum building line, the defined area needs to be 60 to 80 percent or more single family and receive 51 to 55 percent support from property owners. Uh, the homeowners are the ones who do submit the applications and collect the signatures. And our planning department has found that it is sometimes very difficult on streets that are 25% or more vacant or where there is a high percentage of absentee landlords. And this is very common in Northern Third Ward. Um, they have provided in this um, uh, answer a link to the Houston Map Viewer where you can see that the majority of Third Ward's protections of this kind are mainly below Alabama Street. But you can also get a more detailed explanation about the program by calling the planner of the day and they do provide a phone number here. Uh, our next question. Oh, okay. Uh, aside from the funding that comes from out for large developers and corporations, what is being done to build capacity for more housing and commercial structures in third ward and are small businesses being included? Our housing and community development department um, is, manages our uh, federal allotment of um, community development block grant dollars and much of the city's funding for community development is funneled directly to homeowners and local organizations. Um, there is a small rental program uh, that was designed specifically to build the capacity of local nonprofits that could benefit from development at scale. 
And then we also have um, launched this year economic development initiatives that provide grants to micro enterprise businesses that were impacted during Hurricane Harvey. And we also um, have the housing department coordinating with Lift Fund to launch a citywide revolving loan fund. The department also manages our section loan 108 loan program and applications are open for anyone to apply. And then um, what we didn't include here, but uh, during the CARES, I'm sorry, uh, last year at the height of the pandemic, um, the um, uh, housing department also managed significant CARES uh, funding uh, in order to um, make sure that people had uh, rent relief um, funds and also um, worked with um, the small grants program that was also developed in order to help uh, provide some level of stability to our small businesses uh, during the pandemic. The next question we had is, what can we do to expedite and fund simple and inexpensive items like speed bumps, trees, sidewalks, trash cans, curb, curbs and gutters, and street signs to improve quality of life? Um, our Department of Neighborhoods is one of your go-to places to um, address uh, these um, quality of life issues that seem very simple to get moving forward, but we do not have a, a systemic way of expediting. And so there is a recommendation that we create specific programs that are dedicated to specific projects. An example of such a program uh, is the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities that um, has a sidewalk repair program for people with disabilities who need to access essential destinations. And this program is well known within the disability community and receives hundreds of applications a year. And the program seeks to make Houston a more accessible and pedestrian friendly city. HPW currently does not have a process in place to accommodate the complete community's request for expedition of their request. And so um, district council offices that wish to financially support things like speed bump cushions or sidewalk repairs within um, certain boundaries of the complete communities, those offices are still following the normal process. But that is your first uh, point of contact is to talk to your district council office for that. And we do have great um, supporters, allies, and advocates for complete communities and all of our district council members uh, that have complete communities within their um, districts. Uh, the last question we received what, what was, what has been done to improve communications across city departments and are city council members involved in this communication? Um, as it's been shared earlier, Complete Communities is a collaborative effort that involves residents, community stakeholders, and all of City of Houston departments and divisions. Um, and it receives leadership from the North Office of the Communities, the Planning and Development Department, and the Department of Neighborhoods. And so to better facilitate our intergovernmental collaboration, um, the, e the Mayor's Office of Complete Communities selected a work management technology tool uh, called Right to assist department liaisons in gathering and sharing information about the progress on complete communities projects and problem solving across departments. Uh, that using that Right tool is what leads to us to be able to present uh, the progress report that you received this evening. And um, additionally, we, through this office, host a monthly uh, Complete Communities Department Liaisons meetings. There was one today. And that helps us to have cross-departmental discussions on the projects and programs and to continue to track progress. And then we also have monthly collaborative Complete Community meetings with key staff members within the council district offices. And um, Krista Stoneham has done an excellent job of organizing this where she is bringing together uh, the constituent services person and also typically the chief of staff in the district council offices with uh, the uh, lead planner for from the planning and development department, as well as the citizens assistance, um, I'm sorry, the mayor's assistance office liaison uh, from the Department of Neighborhoods to make sure that they all are coordinating on implementation strategies to make progress on each community's action plan move forward. And so that's 10 monthly meetings that are done um, to make sure that we stay coordinated with uh, the council members. The mayor also has uh, the council liaison, um, William Paul Thomas, who keeps track of where we are on complete communities and shares that information as needed as well. So those were all of the questions that we received in advance. Is there, are there any other questions that I could answer this evening? 
Krista, I will stop trying to be in charge of the presentation and turn that <laughs> control back over to the last slide. No problem. Oh, Chris, I do have one thing from the um, the Houston Police Department. Sure. Uh, um, our PIP meetings in the third ward area are back in person at the South Central uh, Police Station. It's going to be every third Tuesday at six o'clock, and the location of that is twenty two oh two Saint Emmanuel. Again, that's twenty two oh two Saint Emmanuel. That's every third Tuesday at six p.m. So they are back in person until further notice, just in case anybody wanted to partake in that or participate in the third ward area. And I'll also text you the flyer so that you can send it out because I'm not that tech savvy okay. I'm here. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. No problem. Well, well, that's the conclusion of our that. presentation. Um, I see uh, Mr. Pettit has come off of mute and turned off his camera. So um, I will go ahead and, and pass the mic on to you. Great. Well, first, I wanted to say, Krista, you did a great job on the updates. Um, and uh, two small additions, and I, I saw that someone had already mentioned it under parks. We should definitely recognize the Third Ward Chess Park. A lot of community members put a lot of work into that pocket park. Um, and uh, I know that planning has also been featuring it at various conferences as a success story. So we should definitely include it in the complete communities update. And also, we do have an active uh, block captain program through Change Happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they're doing a great job and they, they're even giving out small grants to the block captains for um, block oriented projects. Um, I also wanted to go back to the question about kind of communication and engagement. Um, and I want to use the example of Malone Park. I'm excited to see the improvements that have been to, made to Malone Park, uh, but very few people in the residents in the community were aware that they were happening. Um, and for myself as chair of the parks work group, I had no idea they were happening. And I don't know if that's a breakdown from parks to complete communities or complete communities to planning or planning to um, the residents. Um, but that would be something that we would want to be aware of and, and, and to know about. I, you know, we found out just through seeing links on YouTube being shared, but we had no idea in the community uh, you know, what was happening or the event with Chenier Energies and doing the cleanup and um, or what was happening with Israel McLeod. And, uh, you know, we, we would just like to stay abreast of those things. And I'm not sure like where that disconnect was. Um, and another kind of parks issue that we just haven't heard back from is about Moses Leroy. Back in December 2019, there was the issue of $20,000 grant being dedicated to the park. Uh, but we wanted to focus on the playground equipment that was dangerously um, dilapidated and that playground equipment was removed a few months later, but we haven't had any updates since then. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pettit, for sharing all of that. You're absolutely right. The Chess Park is a wonderful success story and congratulations on all of the work you've done on that. Um, and we will definitely include that into the um, update. Um, the your concern about the communications about Zuri Malone Park. Um, I don't know if we have had um, information back into our office as to what's the regular cadence of meetings around yours for us to share back at our department liaison meeting so that people can know when you all are regularly meeting. So we'll make sure that we get that information from you so that we can make sure that the Parks Department is aware of um, your meetings and um, when there are additional uh, efforts going forward on that. I do hope that everyone did receive the invitation or it was mentioned that there will be the celebration uh, at um, Zuri Malone Park on Saturday uh, to um, celebrate the uh, improvements to that park um, that have been made. Um, regarding Leroy Moses, um, thank you for mentioning that. Um, you did share back with us in our office that your uh, committee did not want to accept the funds uh, that the Parks Board was interested in spending in order to make the same improvements it was making in several other, four other complete communities parks around park benches and barbecue um, grills. And so those funds were reallocated to um, the uh, other 
major priority you shared back from your working group about the signs that you wanted to see on Columbia Tap Trail. And that project has been completed um, in the third ward section. And we're looking for additional funds so that um, we would be able to possibly uh, add some more signs to the uh, McGregor Super Neighborhood part of it since the trail doesn't just begin and end in third ward and Edo. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Pettit, your mic has gone out. Mr. Pettit, while you worked on the technical issues, let's go to Mr. Ken Rogers. He has his hand up as well. I have a very simple question. <laughs> that is a uh, complete com community and super neighborhood. Is it one and the same? Is it two different entities? Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know. Can someone help me? I'll let Krista take that one. Or Sasha actually also contribute, I think, the answer to that. I, I'll do the best of my abilities, but um, definitely uh, please join in, team. <laughs> so the Super <laughs> Neighborhood Program <laughs> was created, um, I believe, back in 1999. Um, it was under the administrative uh, of, of Lee Brown, of Mayor Lee Brown, if I am saying that correctly. Please forgive me, I am not a native Houstonian, but I've done the best I can to learn the history for moments like this. Um, and, and basically, it was created in order to bring together residents with business owners and, and really making a space for communities um, to um, have a you know, a conversation with the city about whatever's going on in that particular neighborhood. Um, there were 88 super neighborhoods that were designated under that program. And um, at the time, it was under um, the Planning and Development Department. Um, now it is under um, the leadership of the Department of Neighborhoods, um, which is the other leadership um, office that, that really helps move forward on um, neighborhood-based projects. Now, Complete Communities was created by Mayor Turner um, because he recognized that, you know, he didn't want to be the mayor of two cities, that there were um, some neighborhoods that weren't thriving as much as other neighborhoods. Um, and he initiated this initiative in order for the city of Houston to proactively get involved in terms of facilitating community development. Um, so really kind of took um, the, the vision, in, in, in my uh, personal opinion, of, of you know, really bringing communities together, but really proactively saying that let's do something about it um, and, and let's help to facilitate um, change and, and implementation. But we didn't want to um, do uh, development work to communities. We wanted to do it with them, which is why we initiated the planning process and we um, created action plans with the community members and started that um, comprehensive engagement process. And then, of course, launched the initiative, um, oh, excuse me, the, the Mayor's Office of, Com of Complete Communities to really lead um, uh, and facilitate and steward um, funds from um, discretionary funds from the city of Houston, but also um, externally working with different corporate donors in order to move forward on the project and programs from the action plans. Um, and, and if um, this is still taking place, I, I would need Sasha's uh, help to clarify of how complete communities and super neighborhood work together in third ward. Um, I believe it was decided by the third ward community that they would like complete communities kind of um, integrated into the super neighborhood structure. But um, I will defer to Sasha to help clarify that section on how the two work together now. So we attend, you know, the monthly super neighborhood meetings and complete communities work groups are allowed to report out the progress at each of the meetings. And so they kind of do work together in that regard. And, you know, people who regularly attend the super neighborhood meetings like Ed Pettit, you know, what could verify that he's often gives reports on parks and, and uh, amenities during the super neighborhood meeting. So we do work together. Uh, that was something that was decided uh, before I became a part of this process. Um, and it's up to them if, if they would like to change 
how that works if complete communities has you know we do have our own meetings like this is our own meeting and we'll continue to have our own meetings moving forward but also you know it's just it, it provides a way for people who may not uh, uh, participate in the complete communities function if they're going to super neighborhood meetings they are still are abreast of what is going on in complete communities so mr rogers we've given you uh, quite a lengthy answer for what you stated at the beginning was be a simple <laughs> question but it's not simple because every community is different and every community has chosen its structure for how it wants to continue the work of the complete communities post action plan completion uh, in order to move the work forward. So some communities um, do have it integrated into their super neighborhood, some do not. Some have it um, have had their neighborhood support team evolve into the main working group, some have not. Um, we do think that Third Ward has um, taken a really innovative and great approach of uh, bringing the work groups into the super neighborhood structure and having them report out at super neighborhood meetings on a regular basis, but that each of those um, working groups are um, having their own meetings and moving the work forward. So um, everybody gets to decide. And so I hope at your next super neighborhood meeting, you all will talk about it some more and how you want to see it all continue to work uh, hand in hand. Well, I think we've already decided to keep them together, but I just want to make sure it was legit. <laughs> yes, it's legit because you decided as a community mm -hmm. that that's the way you want to do it. If you decide that's legit, then that's legit. I like that. Is my microphone back on? This is Ed. Yes, it uh, is. So, and again, I loved the signage on the Columbia tab, actually, Theola Pettaway. I get all my information from Theola because I always see her at Doshi House. So that's part <laughs> of the, it's good. It, that's that's an, an embedded planning right there. But um, I would love to just have those updates, you know, emailed. I mean, it's, it, you have all of the work group chair emails on your website. If there's something that's related to education or parks or, um, you know, housing, you know, just include them on the email. And, um, you know, Sasha has been great. I have a feeling the communication uh, breakage is somewhere uh, different apart from Sasha um, because we haven't had updates about Malone Park and Columbia Tap at our super neighborhood updates. Um, so, you know, we have the super neighborhood meetings where we do updates and you have our emails. So those are two avenues that you could uh, engage us in the future. Thanks. We'll make sure that Sasha has all of that information to share with you. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, there's another hand up from. Uh, that is Mr. Then, Roberts from the Parks Department. Yes. Hi, uh, I just wanted to let Ed know that we have some chess tables planned for Malone Park too, and we hope he'll come over and uh, and play some chess at our park. And uh, anything <laughs> we could do to increase uh, communication flow from our department to your department, we'd be happy to do that, uh, uh, Kristen Shannon. Thank you. We Absolutely. Were there any other questions? We do know that it is a Thursday evening and we are now at 746. We don't want to extend this time. Uh, we've answered all of your questions at this point. OK, well, Kristen, we'll send it back to you well, to wrap up. Well, um, thank you so much for your time and thank you. Um, Shannon and um, all the departments that came to support and help address any questions. Um, I'm acknowledging Sean Haley's comment about CCPPI. Looking forward to providing continued support. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely so grateful to have you all right here with us. Um, I'm going to uh, toss it back to Sasha uh, for next steps and um, thank you again. Thank you. Hey, so thank you, Jen. We really appreciate the updates and addressing the questions of the community. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Um, there were, as you saw in the presentation earlier, there were some uh, action plan projects that were kind of put on pause or, you know, maybe need some additional support. So um, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and put out a survey on Let's Talk Houston. I provided the link in the chat. And so the survey is going to ask you 
to help us prioritize the projects that you feel are most important right now that we could move forward. I know I saw the State of Third Ward Summit. That's something that we can work on together. Also, there was a, a safety issue about the streetlights. We can work on those things together, but we want to make sure that we prioritize the projects that are left so we know how to hit the ground running. So I'll put the survey up uh, probably tomorrow. It will be on our Let's Talk Houston page, and I'll probably leave it up for about two weeks or so. And uh, I want you uh, to take the survey. Once we put it out, encourage your neighbors to also take the survey. And once the results are put out, We'll make sure to share those results on Let's Talk Houston and via your email, and we'll schedule another meeting uh, where we can meet and say, hey, this is what you chose that was most important and who would like to help lead those projects. So that is going to be the next steps for how we move forward with completing this complete community because we need all of us to make this community complete. So uh, if you, I know we had some people in the chat say, you know, how can I be a part of this? How can I help lead? Email me. Um, you know, uh, I posted the link for the action plan as well. So you can see the action plan uh, for yourself and look at some of the projects that you would be interested in leading. So you have all the information is that you need. Um, let us know if you need more information. We're already here. I put my um, phone number to the office and email into the chat as well. Holler at your girl. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And thank you, Commissioner Precinct 1. This was a great meeting and a great presentation. We do agree with you. So if there aren't any more questions, comments, or anything like that, we will bid you adieu. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Hey, Sasha, don't forget to uh, stop recording. Just trying to um, find out how to get the list just now before I leave, because I always forget to do that. <laughs> Great meeting.